We are about to begin another episode of the Prosperident webinar series. From their unique perspective as dentistry's embezzlement experts, Prosperident's team brings you information you will not find anywhere else. Now sit back and relax while Prosperident's Amber Weber, Wendy Askins, and David Harris address the issues that are important to you. Good evening, dental family. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Wendy Askins, and I'm joined with my amazing co-host, Amber Weber, also from Texas, and David Harris from Halifax. Um, Tonight, we're going to talk about slamming the door on thieves and embezzlement. Please submit your questions through Zoom. We love questions. The more detailed, the better. And Anyone who submits a question and we read it aloud this evening is going to receive a copy of David Harris's book, The Art of Theft and the Science of Control. And that will come directly from David. So maybe he'll sign it for you. Right, Dave? Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay, so the session tonight is being recorded and we're being live streamed on several different um, social media sites as well. And if you want to preview or review the session tonight, it will be posted tomorrow. Um, as well, we have a kind of a special thing we're doing a little bit different this evening. Um, to thank you guys for joining us live, we're going to give you um, some special documents or some courtesy gifts from the three of us that aren't going to be available through um, recorded and posted sessions. Because we just, again, want to say thank you for joining us live this evening. Um, you can find us on uh, other videos on our website and on YouTube and also on podcast. And once, as always, we want to thank um, Altura Periodonics for providing continuing education for us this evening. Wendy, tell us about who's on the screen. <laughs> um, this was one of my cases. Um, her name is Karen Tinney, um, and she was a naughty girl, and she committed theft through payroll, and we caught her, and she was charged with a felony, so very happy about that, and that's a recent one as well, so. Well done. Yeah, thank you. Well, it's summertime, and we're all trying to stay cool, so we wanted to bring you a special summer series on how to prevent your practice, protect your practice from overheating. So we're really excited to bring some hot topics to you this summer. July 22nd, we're going to focus on external threats to your practice. Then we'll follow up on August 19th, things employees should not be allowed to do. We definitely don't want your practice getting overheated from that. And September 23rd is going to be very exciting and very necessary for all of us in dentistry. Our special session is going to feature cybersecurity. So that's a big hot topic in the world right now. You will receive a registration link um, after tonight's webinar. So please follow that link and register for our Protect Your Practice from Overheating so we can all stay cool. All right. And Wendy and Amber, you probably don't know this, but I bet you tonight our Canadian live audience is really small. And the reason is that uh, we have one team that is one game away from playing in the Stanley Cup finals in hockey. So if you're Canadian and you're listening to this on recording, I sure hope Montreal won tonight. Um, and for those of you who are Canadian and, and who have chosen to forego hockey and join us here, um, you, you, you have my, uh, my, my unending love. <laughs> let's talk about slamming the door shut. And we're going to have a few themes tonight. The first one is we're going to talk about watching finances, but we're also going to spend some time on employee behavior. Uh, this is something that you should all say every morning before breakfast. If I have an employee and they have financial responsibility, they need oversight. How much and when and things like that we'll discuss, but we just cannot have people handling money who have no supervision. We're gonna talk about financial monitoring, which is, which is really that supervision that I'm talking about. Um, Amber's got a great concept that she calls the three Ds, which are define, delegate, and document. And uh, I can't wait to hear from her on that. And we're gonna talk about how not to hire an embezzler. And we, 
Amber, Wendy, and I, and really every, every one of us at Prosperity have all had experiences with what are called serial embezzlers. So these are people who steal in one place and they get fired and two weeks later, they're working across the street. So let's talk about how to slam the door shut on them. Let's look at behavior for a few minutes. And the first thing I wanna tell you is this, and the, the, the information I'm giving you on this slide came from a 2007 study that the American Dental Association did where they asked a bunch of dentists if they'd been embezzled. And for those who said yes, one of the follow-up questions was, what tipped you off? How did you know that you had been stolen from? And the results are kind of surprising and they have some really big implications for how you control embezzlement in your practice. Um, there were a lot of answers given to that question. You know, everything from my CPA found the embezzlement to uh, I had an employee who didn't want to take vacation. And what I did was I went back and I categorized the answers into two categories. One was financial indicators of embezzlement and the other was behavioral. So your CPA finding the theft, which is pretty rare, um, that would be an example of a financial indicator or the day sheet not balancing to the bank deposit. Behavioral would be things like the person who didn't want to take vacation. And look at what happens here. Two thirds of embezzlement, more than two thirds of embezzlement was uncovered, not because of a financial anomaly, but because of how the thief was acting. So when we're watching our practices, absolutely, we gotta watch the pennies. But we also need to look at how our staff behave. So the obvious question is, what does embezzling behavior look like? I'm gonna give you some of the most common warning signs. The first one is this. When somebody steals, they really wanna be by themselves in their practice. There are a couple of reasons for that. First of all, they don't want the doctor poking his or her head into their workspace and saying, oh, Sally, what are you doing? And secondly, I know this sounds a little funny, but stealing takes concentration. And it's hard to muster that concentration when the phone is ringing and you've got patients wandering through the office and um, you know, the doctor looking for stuff and all those things. So thieves will tend to work their schedules so that they're alone sometimes. And they will come in early or they'll stay late or they'll kind of slide into the office on Saturdays, but they'll get that alone time. The second thing, and I'll get, uh, I'm, I'm sure, uh, affirmation from Wendy and Amber on this, uh, a lot of thieves display a fairly strong territoriality. And what I mean by that is they're possessive about their duties. It will often even extend to their workspace. You know, this is the person who in some cases will get upset because somebody else sat at their desk or touched their computer. And they don't wanna take vacation in a lot of cases. Um, when a thief goes on vacation, they give up control of how information flows through the practice. So in, in stealing in certain ways, uh, the practice may get calls from patients asking about their bills. If the thief is the one who answers those phone calls, they'll mollify the patients and make them happy and it will never come to the doctor's attention. If the thief's gone, that doesn't happen. The cousin of territoriality is they don't want to cross train anybody to do any part of their job because cross training can lead to devolution and they don't want that to happen. The word that can strike terror into the heart of a thief is consultant. They know they can fool you, but somebody who thinks about dentistry as a business as opposed to a healing art and is not under the embezzler spell is a whole different story. So if you say to your staff, I've got great news, we're gonna bring in a consultant and somebody pushes back really hard and threatens to quit, let's, uh, let's wonder what's behind that. This person will cut ethical corners. And you know, if, if you and an embezzler are walking down the street together and you see somebody's wallet fall out of their pants, uh, 50 feet in front of you, uh, what you would probably do without giving it a whole lot of thought is bend down, pick up the wallet and walk a little faster and catch up to the person who lost it and say, here, this fell out of your pocket. And the thief may do that too, but via a little different thought process. 
they'll ask themselves a couple of questions that you probably wouldn't. Like, I wonder if anybody else saw that wallet fall. And I wonder how much money is in the wallet. Again, the, the outward behavior may be the same, but they get there via a very different process. And the final one, and this is just a basic observation about human nature. Honest people do not feel the compulsion to emphasize their honesty to others. So when one of your staff insists on telling you or showing you repeatedly how honest they are, look out, that's, that's not really congruent with honesty. So those are some of the behavioral signs. There are a lot more, but uh, these, are, these are some of the most prevalent and really good ones to watch for. I always like to think of those behaviors as um, a lack of transparency. That's a really easy way for me to think about it. If you have someone that is stealing, they don't want to answer questions. They don't want anybody else in their accounts that won't be transparent at all. But if you have someone who's working really hard for you and going above and beyond, they'll always be willing to tell you what's happening in their accounts and they'll always be willing to train. So I love the word transparency. Um, anyway, um, as human beings, it's nature or it's natural for us when we begin a relationship, be it a personal relationship, a friend relationship, or even an employment or business partner relationship, that we have a period of testing um, to see if we can really trust that person, to see if what they're telling us is true and are their actions congruent with what their words are. Unfortunately, once we get through that testing period, we tend to rest on our laurels and set the bar at a high level of trust and, and just give over to them completely. Unfortunately, at Prosperident, we've had several clients who have gone through more than one investigation um, in their practice in general. I'm working on a case right now, which breaks my heart um, because the woman has been working for this client for over 25 years. And luckily he noticed that her behavior had changed. And again, we were talking about transparency. She went from being transparent to being non-transparent and all of those signs that David just talked about in the previous slide, all of those signs, she began to, she began to start showing those signs and he was concerned. And so he called Prosperident and he said, you know, she's, I know she's got some financial issues going on in her life. She's just filed uh, for bankruptcy and had some other issues happen. Her behavior's changed and I'm concerned that something might be going on. And sure enough, unfortunately, he was right. So if we can think of trust, not as a static concept, but as a fluid concept, something that's ever changing, because our morals and values and our circumstances in life can change as we move along as well, um, we need to constantly be vigilant that trust is not a forever concept. It's a trust and verify type of movement or action. So true. One of the myths that just won't go away, and I kind of touched on it a minute ago, is that if embezzlement is happening, my accountant will find it for me. And I'm a CPA myself. I don't, I, I, I haven't been in accounting practice for a very long time, but um, I'll, I'll say a couple of things to this. The first is that dentistry is different from almost every other business because it has split accounting records. So you've got practice management software that tracks revenue and accounts receivable, and you've got accounting software like QuickBooks, for example, that tracks expenses and payroll and things like that. And that's, uh, it, first of all, it's in, in the big picture, it's nonsensical. If you went to your accountant and said, you know, I'm thinking of starting a business and I want to split the accounting between two pieces of software, the accountant would say, that's the dumbest idea I ever heard. I mean, there's no way that would work. And yet that's every dental practice. Um, so accountants aren't used to that. It, it, it is just fundamentally illogical. 
The second thing is when you hire your accountants to do your year end work, they very explicitly do not have a mandate to look for embezzlement. And you sign this thing called an engagement letter. And if you read it carefully, which um, I, I suspect is not a very popular activity, but if you did, it says very directly in there, we are not looking for embezzlement. I mean, of course, if we find it, we'll tell you, but it's not in our mandate. And the final thing is that they just do not have the experience or training or the thought process to really find embezzlement. And we have uh, about 15 investigators at Prosperinet. Uh, I am the only one who has CPA after his name. Uh, most of them, well, all of them come from a dental background. Uh, Amber was uh, a hygienist originally, and then an office manager, and then a consultant, and then an investigator. Wendy um, filled a, a, a lot of roles, including a, the pra a practice manager of a big multi-practice office. But for the most part, accountants don't make great investigators for the kind of stuff we do. So CPAs are not all that likely to find stealing if it's happening. Well, let's talk about a daily review. And I, I just want to give a shout out. I said there would be very few Canadians on the, on, on the webinar tonight. I did see one, my friend, Evelyn Ramsey, who's a, who's a consultant. Uh, hi, Ev, great to, great to have you in the audience. And, and I know what you're sacrificing to be here. Um, let's talk about what to look at on a, on a daily basis. And the first thing that I'm going to say is this, the reports that you review as a practice owner should be ones that you printed yourself. If you allow a staff member to print reports and hand them to you, you have no control over the assumptions under which those reports were generated. And what that opens the door to is selective reporting where there's some stuff hidden from you. And if you have a chance to watch our webinar from last month, so that was the May 2021 webinar, uh, one of our senior, one of our most senior examiners, Scott Clifford, um, described a, a, a huge, massive case he was working on where the malfeasance was hidden by a selective reporting. Um, the second thing is this, as a practice owner, you need to take the approach that I'm going to look at all monetary transactions in my practice. I don't necessarily have to spend a lot of time doing this, but at a minimum, I better give the once over each day to all the transactions that have financial implications. So uh, basically fees, payments, adjustments. Um, it doesn't take long and it's easy to do at the end of the day when stuff is fresh in your mind. It's a whole lot harder to make sense of those same entries if you're looking at them two weeks later. Um, most of you who own practices know this, but you really need to look at adjustments because they are a pipeline through which a lot of money can be embezzled and concealed. Um, at, we're going to use tonight generic names for reports from practice management software. So your software may have a name that's a little bit different for this, but you'll get the idea. Every software can generate a report that says, here are the insurance claims that were filed today. So that's a really good day in report to look at. And if people were in and insurance claims were not filed on them, you need to wonder why. Um, intuitively, that doesn't make sense. And almost every practice can file claims electronically. So, you know, you hit a couple of buttons and the claim is sent. So that's a, that's a really good report to, to spend a couple of minutes on. Monthly oversight, one of the most important things, in my opinion, um, is reconciliation of the funds that are recorded in your practice management software with funds that are actually deposited in the bank. Now, luckily, this can be outsourced because it can take a lot of time. Big practice, small practice, multi-practice, solo practitioner, it doesn't matter. It takes a lot of time. Um, let me talk real quick about, or share with you real quick about exactly how to do that. Um, as Dave said, a lot of people think that their CPA is, re is reconciling their books for them at the end of the month, but actually they're not. So you can hire companies that specifically do reconciliation for you. Um, your CPA may have a bookkeeper in the office that they recommend you use. Um, you can even use a staff member. 
as long as that staff member does not have access to your practice management software, because then it gets kind of squirrely where you have somebody posting it and you have somebody checking it is the same person, right? There's some separation of duties. But what you want to make sure of is that what you're looking at on the bank statement or on your care credit statement or on your merchant service statement for your credit cards, that matches what went into your bank account. I've had several clients who have said, well, the way that I reconcile is I take my merchant statement that comes from the credit card company and I match it to my bank statement. That doesn't catch embezzlement in your practice. What it does is it catches any type of mistake that the credit card company made, right? Because it, they're depositing. What you need to know is what was recorded in my practice management software and what actually went into the bank for me. Um, you can do this on a daily basis or have someone do it on a daily basis for you. But again, it, it can be quite tedious. If you want to do that, that's fine. If you want to wait until the end of the month when you get your bank statement and then you want to go through all of your day sheets and your computerized uh, deposit slips and you want to track back to your bank statement, that's perfectly fine as well. Wendy, I love that you, you mentioned that, you know, your practice management software is the key because there's that gray area. So one thing, no matter what software you're doing, I think it's very important to take advantage of your software and look at all the different reports it has to offer. There's so many different things to know about the practice rather than just payments received or credit card statements that came through the practice. Um, some really key things to focus on um, that I'm passionate about is your insurance aging report. Uh, how long are you waiting for insurance to pay you? So that's something that maybe hasn't come through to your bank yet. You produce that money, but you know, what's the system? Talk with your team members. What's the transparency? Why, why haven't we gotten this payment? Um, so that's one great tool that you need to definitely look at on a monthly basis is that insurance aging report. Another one is adjustments. Um, it's, it's very common in dentistry to have adjustments and write-offs, especially because we are a network with insurance and there's a lot of moving parts and variables that can happen. But you really want to know the details of these adjustments. So at a minimum, on a monthly basis, you need to really narrow in on those adjustments and see how that's affecting your practice uh, from an overall uh, productivity standpoint. Um, so you won't be comparing that with your banking, but it's something that from um, the, a business owner practice management standpoint, you really understand the details of that. Another key one um, that I know, Wendy, you are one of the ones that really got me into this when I first came on to Prosperant is deleted transactions. So really look at what happened throughout the month that was deleted? What, what type of payments were deleted? Were those accurately dealt with on those patient ledgers? Another one that I see in some practice management software is procedures are deleted um, because the incorrect procedure was posted to that patient account, so we had to delete it. That's common and that can happen, but the issue is if it becomes a constant issue in your practice, here's an opportunity from a business fan standpoint to review that and help get your team more efficient and thoroughly trained. Okay, what are we doing? Are we in a rush? What's happening? Are we not taking full advantage of our software? So that one is also a key standpoint to understand our procedures being completed correctly. Uh, does your staff need help? Um, is your software, are you using your software to the greatest capability? There, there's a lot of things that th that report will help you really focus on how the practice is um, operating on a daily minute by minute basis, basis with patients. And another one that plays into that is modified transactions. So, you know, maybe we had to change the services on a procedure that was done, or we entered the wrong payment type and we had to go back and change it. So we didn't necessarily have to completely delete that, but we had to modify that. So again, a great tool for you to understand how is your team operating the practice? How can you help contribute to that practice, practice success and know all the details and the moving parts that are occurring on a, a daily and monthly basis. Amber, I'm so glad um, that you made that point about reviewing these reports. It's not just about trying to find embezzlement or trying to stop embezzlement, but it's also a tool you can use that's very valuable to find out some of the weaknesses of your team, where they need more training even, or 
Um, you know, if, if you have someone who continues to post um, a payment in the raw, under the wrong payment method in the wrong payment category, you know, if you look at your deleted transactions, you can figure out that that person is struggling and they need some help in learning how to post payments correctly. So I'm so glad you brought that up. But let's dive a little bit deeper into some of these reports and exactly what you're going to be looking for, because it can be a little bit overwhelming at times. Um, when we're talking about looking for adjustments, first of all, a lot of times thieves will hide or they'll use an adjustment to back. Okay, good. Um, first of all, miscellaneous adjustments. Um, miscellaneous adjustments as a category of adjustment. Now, a category of adjustment is a, an accounting code. So for example, say you have a senior citizens discount. That is, should be a write-off or a discount account, legitimate accounting code in your practice management software so that whenever you offer that, your staff member can go down from the drop, me drop uh, menu and um, select discount senior citizens, right? It should be that specific. One thing that I highly discourage is a miscellaneous adjustment category. And you would really be surprised how many people have that in their system. I just had a, um, a follow-up um, a follow-up conversation with one of my clients today. And that was the number one thing that his staff member was using. Miscellaneous adjustments. What's it for? Is that legitimate? How do I verify it? it? There's no description, it just says miscellaneous, right? So if you have that in your software, number one, I wouldn't say get rid of it, but I would say very sparsely used. Number two, timing and plausibilities. For example, um, EFT payments or direct deposit insurance payments that go directly into your bank account, how timely are those posted? Are those posted a month after they've been deposited in your, in your bank account and you see them a month later in your, in your software? Um, another example is um, if you're going to take an insurance write-off or an insurance write-down for a capitation plan, that occurs, that write-off occurs whenever the insurance payment is received. Right. So for every one of those types of negative adjustments that you see, you should look at the be able to look at the ledger and see an insurance payment posted and then the write off taken off of off of there. Now, if you're reviewing these adjustments and you see um, out of nowhere an adjustment for a cap plan shows up, then you might need to start asking yourself some questions about how it just appeared right, without a payment. Um, and then magnitude and appropriateness. Thieves, like I said, they use adjustments and they often are drawn to a certain adjustment code, if that makes sense. So what they'll do is they'll use that code to write off balances that they're stealing from or write off balances on accounts that they're stealing from. Let me go back to using the senior citizens discount. Um, you know, let's say you give a 10% a discount to senior citizens and you're looking at that particular adjustment category that month and you've got like a hundred of them, right? Well, you know which patients you give a senior citizen discount to, and you know you didn't give a hundred. You know you didn't see a hundred senior citizens that all got a discount, right? So you would go back and make sure that make sure that you verify those particular adjustments in that category that seems to be inflated. Um, and then my favorite, I always talk about it. Amber talked about the deleted payments and how important they are and deleted transactions and how important they are. The deleted transaction report can get pretty messy just because of human error. If you're not going to look at anything else on that report, please, please look at deleted cash payments because as always, it's true today as it was 10 years ago when I started um, examinations or probably as long as David has been doing examinations, cash is still the number one target, 
right? So when you're looking at your deleted cash payments, find the patient's name for the deleted payment, the name and the amount, go to the patient's ledger and find out what the resolution was. What I mean by that is you have a deleted cash payment. If on the ledger, a cash payment is reposted again, and there's a little bit of change in it, that was a simple employee mistake and they typed in the wrong numbers. If you have a deleted cash payment and you see a check payment reposted on the patient's ledger, if, that's, if that scenario was true and that really happened, that it was just an error, when you reconcile your bank statements to your software, your practice management software, it will be correct, right? Same thing goes, if you see a cash payment and it's reposted as a credit card payment, reconciliation of your merchant statement to your practice management software will prove that that was actually a credit card payment. If you see a cash payment that is deleted and when you look at the patient's ledger, it's posted as a discount or some type of a negative adjustment, call us because you probably have a problem. Yes, Wendy, that was one of the first things that I learned from you uh, coming into Prosperity. And I've had several cases where I've seen that. So big, big, big tip. Now, moving on to um, dual insurance adjustments. Insurance is something that I'm passionate about uh, for many reasons, but I've seen a lot of discrepancies in insurance adjustments. And it not doesn't always necessarily mean that there's fraud or embezzlement. A lot of it is just understanding how those adjustments, number one, need to happen in a practice software, and if your practice software is set up correctly for how those payments are being received. A couple of things that really stand out with dual insurance adjustments is sometimes you'll be in network with one insurance company that the patient has that covers dental services. However, the other one you may not be in network with. So this can get where insurance adjustments need to be very, very uh, detailed and defined and you need to understand if those adjustments are being done correctly. One of my recommendations uh, that I see in a lot of practices is it'll just say PPO discount or insurance adjustment, just one broad statement. I definitely recommend that you get really, really detailed in the type of insurance adjustments that are occurring in your software and know the reason so that when you do utilize your practice management software and you are printing those reports, it doesn't just say insurance adjustment, and it's a big, huge blanket statement. That's similar to having that miscellaneous adjustment category that Wendy was talking about. So really understand the details. Um, but one of the main things uh, with those dual insurance adjustments is a couple things can happen. It, it'll end up as a debit adjustment to where the patient will have a credit and they shouldn't. So those are things you need to look for, what type of adjustments. It always isn't just a negative adjustment and a write-off. You need to really get into the details on that. Uh, another thing that you want to focus on on dual insurance adjustments is did one insurance pay and then the other one was adjusted off? Was that claim actually sent? Uh, you want to make sure of that. Uh, and then also on dual insurance adjustments, you need to make sure that um, you, re you look at those EOBs. Look at the documentation and that transparency. So when you're reviewing those on in, a de in detail with your team members, you want to go over the documentation so that both of you have a clear understanding and you have that transparency and you can trust, but also verify that with your with your team members. Another thing that I'm really, really passionate about, especially, especially recently, because I've had several cases uh, with this lately, is make sure, even though you're looking at your insurance aging report, are your claims being sent and generated how they should be? Uh, I have a case uh, I recently finished up where the doctor actually had to write off quite a bit of um, income that was supposed to be coming his way just because the claims were not actually sent. And those adjustments started showing up in his uh, software is insurance adjustment, insurance adjustment. And when we started looking at the details of those, it wasn't necessarily that the adjustment should have happened. It was that the claim was not sent in a timely fashion. Um, so you wanna really make sure of that. Uh, the other thing is if you're out of network, and you have a payment going toward the patient where the patient pays you directly, make sure those claims are closed out so that um, 
you, you don't have a huge insurance aging report where you're looking for claims that necessarily they're properly handled. Let's talk about dashboards. So there are a lot of third-party add-on softwares that will work with your practice management software, harvest data from it, and, and give you extra information that you wouldn't have elsewhere. And there are a lot of good choices. Um, you've, you've probably heard some of the names like Dental Intel and Practice by Numbers and Seekasoft. Um, and in a lot of cases, they can they can give you information that is in your practice management software, but just not readily available. Um, the other advantage of dashboards is that uh, if somebody's working with multiple offices that use different practice management software, then an example might be somebody who's consulting to 10 different offices. What the dashboards do is they kind of homogenize the information so that if I'm looking at a practice that's using Dentrix or I'm looking at a practice that's using Open Dental, what I see is the consultant is the same. So a lot of DSOs, for example, and, and many DSOs have, have many different softwares, you know, they find dashboards particularly helpful so that the people working with them don't really need to know much about any specific software. Um, they can also help you spot practice opportunities. You know, the, some of the dashboards are really good at finding things like uh, unbooked work that, that could be done. Um, the question is, do they help find embezzlement? And the answer is, in general, no. The, the purpose of a dashboard is to give you a view from 10,000 feet up. And most of the time when embezzlement is found, and certainly when our investigators find it, you know, they're, they're in the weeds looking, not, not taking a picture from an airplane flying over. Uh, so dashboards are great. There's, there's a lot of potential for them in terms of trend. For the most part, they're probably not going to help you spot embezzlement. You're muted, Amber. No. All right. This is something I'm very, very passionate about, the three Ds. So define, delegate, and document. So let's talk about the true meaning of the word define. Uh, to show or describe someone or something clearly and completely um, the boundaries, right? The, the meaning and the scope. So that was one of the key things you need to do in your practice is define. You want to make sure, okay, let's define the rules, how things are going to be conducted, what I want to accomplish, how the practice management software will be treated, what I expect to happen at the end of each day closing, how money will be handled. I mean, there's so many variables. It's like rebuilding an engine. But you have to have a true definition of this, right? Uh, and sometimes that's hard because a lot of us think we go in and we're like, well, I know what I want to do, and so does the team. But you really need to have a true definition of all the rules. Um, of your practice. Uh, then it, it comes to delegation. And this is where we talk a lot about separation of duties. So not one person should be able to complete all transactions or all uh, procedures within the dental office. So you need to delegate. Okay, I've defined my foundation, the rules, how thing, I want things to be safeguarded in my practice. Now I need to delegate so I have true separation of responsibilities within my team and myself so that we have to have that communication and we have to follow the rules of the game. And so that's a big, big um, uh, to do for me. So, but after you've completed all that, the key thing here is to document, right? So if we didn't write it down, it didn't happen. So for example, one clear definition that you need to have and you need to get, delegate to the proper team members, but then also document is an example is a discount policy. I've had several cases recently where multiple discounts were given to patients for variable reasons. It wasn't always used as a miscellaneous discount, but these discounts were widespread and there was no true definition of how to apply them, when they could be applied, and who had to authorize these discounts to happen in the practice. So that's just one example of the reason you need to follow those three Ds that de define, delegate, and document. Um, in those three Ds, you also need to have the steps of how it's recorded um, and who will be in charge of doing it, who will cross-reference. Uh, like I said, the Robin Hood fraud that we're seeing where there's no uh, true definition and, and delegation and documentation on how that's done, it allows you, after you've done a hard day's work, to be doing some dentistry for maybe less than what you thought you were comfortable with. Um, 
And then uh, the other thing is this documentation. It's not just writing one little piece of paper out and saying, here's the rules. There's really four key areas that I like to focus on um, that we see as something to safeguard your practice. Uh, number one, your compensation. What are you going to be paying uh, your employee? And is that in writing? Have you agreed with that in writing? I know Wendy, along with myself, we've had some cases of payroll uh, where an employee was compensated more than was verbally agreed upon, but there were some areas that we could not show that the employee was paid more than they should have been because there was actually nothing in writing uh, that backed up uh, part of what we found. And then the fraudulent conduct policy, this, this is a really important one because this is what outlines your definition of fraud and how the action plan that will happen if something is detected, how you will bring in a third party. Um, and they, you give this to your employees and they acknowledge what's happened. Um, if your employees just are handed a piece of paper just to read over and you talk about it and walk away, that's not enough. It has to be signed and true acknowledgement and understanding that you have both met, you've talked about it and you've documented it and they understand moving forward how this is going to work. Uh, the third one is when some of those rules are broken and you've defined and delegated how certain things are going to happen in the office, adjustments or discounts are applied and they should not have been or were outside that scope and that boundary that you have created, that is when that progressive discipline action has to be taken and it has to be documented. A verbal warning is not sufficient. This has to be written and agreed upon and acknowledged by both you and the team member. And then the fourth one that needs to help you, your team and everybody feel comfortable, if they do see somebody not following the three Ds that we've talked about, you also have a whistleblower policy. We've talked about this in previous webinars, um, but it allows a team member who sees the three Ds of your practice not being uh, followed, that they have the safety in having that and coming forward to you to help safeguard your practice. And they don't worry about other team members finding out. So you need to also have that defined, delegated and documented. Yeah, um, Amber, maybe I'll just, because Amber made a good point about Robin Hood fraud, and that's the first time that we've really used this term in a webinar. Maybe I'll just um, give a second of explanation about what it is. Uh, when we talk about Robin Hood fraud, we're talking about somebody in your practice essentially writing off balances for people they're not connected to. So this could be because they don't want to ask people for money, or they feel sorry for somebody, or maybe it's just trying to sabotage you. But when we talk about Robin Hood, and Robin Hood, of course, was the, the medieval character who stole from the rich and gave to the poor, um, we're talking about normally unauthorized adjustments. So it, it's something we see fairly regularly. And I would say, ladies, that the trend is, is upward with it. In other words, we're seeing more over time. And we just want to make, uh, make the audience aware of the concept and what it means. Yeah, and can I add to that also, David, in, in the last few cases that I have been on, um, there was nothing documented as to how these adjustments were to happen. Um, and a lot of it was just verbal agreements with team members. So it was really, really hard for uh, the owner, the practice owner to remember what the rules were. And he's, oh, I think I approved that one for that patient, but the next patient maybe couldn't remember, right? Um, so. I mean, what I, what I always say, and uh, um, Amber and Wendy have heard this many times, to convict somebody for fraud, you need one of two things. You either need documentation, which is what Amber's talking about, where there's a clear discount policy, for example, and somebody violates it, or you need deception. And deception is when you, um, when you record events that are different than what really happened. So normally we need one of those two things to, to get a fraud conviction. So. Uh, that's why Amber's uh, discussion about documentation is so important. You know, if we're trying to nail somebody for payroll fraud, we need to be able to establish how much they should have been paid. And you compare that to what they actually were paid. And if there's a difference, um, you have a fraud case. If we ask somebody how much uh, their office manager should be paid, and the answer is, well, you know, I hired her 10 years ago and we had a written employment agreement, but we've, you know, we've given her annual raises since. Like, there, there's no case there. Yeah, that's exactly right. I, I love everything you're saying about that. Um, 
documentation, document, document, even on your patient notes and, and charts. Um, okay, so now that we've slammed the door, and if you find an if you find embezzlement is occurring, what are some of the ways that you can recover money or stolen money? Um, my passion happens to be employee dishonesty insurance, um, just because I, I love working with the insurance companies, oddly enough, on the other end of Amber. <laughs> um, anyway, um, when I speak with a lot of clients or even just out if, if I'm doing um, an in-person um, speaking event, a lot of people will say, well, I, I don't have insurance for this. How do I get it? Here's the good news. You do. Most likely 99% you do. It's included in your property insurance. So if someone were to bash in your windows and steal everything out of your office, it would go under your property insurance. Think of it kind of the same way. If somebody bashes in your monetary system and takes your money out or steals your money out, it's covered under your property insurance. Another thing that it, you need, it is important for you to know is that a standard policy is $25,000. So if you've ever heard us speak before, you've heard us throw around some pretty big numbers. Um, so we recommend somewhere between coverage of $75,000 to $100,000. Because if it happens to you, when it happens to you, it's probably going to be in that range. Um, it, it won't, it'll cost you a couple of dollars to bump up the uh, maximum payout for that insurance policy. So go ahead and bump it up. Um, also, a lot of people are hesitant about, uh, about their insurance because most insurance companies require that a police report be filed. Um, now, David and I had this conversation the other day in that, um, he, you know, he pointed out, if you take a prosperity report of, of embezzlement findings to a police station and you tell them, I want to file a police report. Here's the report. Here's what happened. Here's the amount. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to run right out and they're going to bring charges against that person. Because what I find are a lot of, uh, a, a lot of victims are anxious to reclaim on their insurance, but there's still a love in their heart for that employee and they don't want them to go to jail, right? They don't want to, they don't want them to be charged with a felony. Um, so I just won't say anything about that. <laughs> I have, I, I really don't yeah. have. A it, lot it, it, it's easy though, Wendy, if you, if you go to the police and you say, I need to make an insurance claim and I need to, I need a file number from you, but it's not important to me that anything happens to this person. Uh, the police have fairly full plates. And the last thing they're going to do is chase down a thief when the victim says, it doesn't matter to me what happens to them. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's really easy to turn the police off if that's what you want to do. Yeah, that's if you don't want to file. Yeah. You don't want the police to go after them. Yeah, that's um, easy. But anyway, so I'm, I'm sorry, I got kind of uh, off track there. Um, some other questions are, does it cover Robin Hood theft, which is what Amber was talking about and what Dave spoke about previously? Um, in the insurance policies that I have read, there has to be a direct personal benefit to the suspect um, most of the time for uh, you to be able to file a claim. So what that, what that basically means is if, I, if my next door neighbor comes in and I give them a 80% discount off your UCR, and I don't advise you of that, but I make the decision to do it to an insurance company that is not considered under theft that they would pay out in a claim because the suspect, which would be me, did not personally obtain that benefit or that property. And then also investigation costs. Again, it comes down to your policies, your policy. I've had a lot of clients with policies that the cost of the investigation, um, associated attorney's fees, um, cost of the client's fees for the work that they've done in the investigation and the time it took for them, all of that can be covered as well. It just depends on your policy.
let's talk about hiring for a minute. And um, my, I, I see my friend uh, Carl's in the audience. Uh, Carl owns a company that does background investigations and, and he uh, d does this kind of service for dental practices. So um, look him up. Carl Slicer is his name. You know, we all have our own mental picture of what a criminal looks like. Um, probably if this person applied for a job at your practice, you'd, you'd give it a lot of thought before you hired them. Um, the problem is that not all criminals look the way we think criminals look. Here are some pictures of embezzlers and they just look like everybody else. Um, a lot of dentists think that they can sort of give somebody some kind of smell test to see if, if they're uh, going to be a problem or not. And it's just not reliable. Embezzlers are, are in a lot of cases, long-term trusted employees. As I say, they just look like everybody else. Some of them teach Sunday school and we cannot tell with our eyeball or, or, or our gut instinct uh, whether somebody has baggage or not. And here's an example. Um, her name is, well, she's used several names. Sharon Yarkovsky is, is one of them. Fuchs is another. Her first name is Irina. Um, I kind of like the Fuchs because quite frankly, she's fooked a lot of dentists out of their money. Um, she has done, she is the, the most prolific serial embezzler I've ever encountered. Um, she's kind of the energizer bunny of embezzlement. And she has worked at and stolen from approximately 15 practices. She's also served two prison terms. And you know what? She keeps getting hired. She is able to convince the doctor who's interviewing her now that she is the answer to that doctor's prayers. And Every dentist I've ever talked to about hiring says that's one of the parts of my job that I absolutely hate. And when you hate doing a job and you find a shortcut, you take it. She's worked at at least five practices after her second prison term. Okay, so she's gone to jail twice and five more dentists hired her. Um, that should not be happening. Background checks are really important and there are a lot of areas of, of somebody's background to check um, but a criminal records check and speaking with former employers are two that I would never, ever skip. You know, the irony of most bad hiring decisions is that the information was sitting right there. I mean, if you Google search this woman, uh, you will find that she has about three pages on our hall of shame. Okay. And five employers didn't even go that far. Okay. This is the kind of information that may be out there that's generally fairly easy to find. And you just need to resolve to know a little bit more about the people you're about to hire than most dentists do. All right. So because we are so appreciative of our live audience and we love that everybody has taken time at their end of their, their day to join us live, um, we are doing some special giveaways for only those who have participated in you know, ate your popcorn while you watched our embezzlement movie this evening. Um, number one, you're going to receive, receive our monthly monitoring spreadsheet. It uh, comes with some guidelines and, and instructions to give you direction and some overview on the oversight areas that we talked about this evening. And then you're also going to receive our template fraudulent conduct policy. So that'll help you tie in those three Ds that we talked about um, earlier in, in the webinar. Amber, I'm so glad you're my friend. You are, you're just so adorable. Amber sent me. <laughs> you're so cute and so smart. <laughs> anyway, um, you know, as, as we begin to wrap up, um, I just wanted to comment that we know that this is, and embezzlement is a very serious topic and it's very heavy. Um, and a lot, a lot of people are interested in um, learning how to prevent embezzlement. And I sometimes struggle with that word prevent because we can't control human nature. That's why whenever I talk to a client and they're beating themselves up because they've, they've been embezzled from, you know, my message to them is always, this isn't your fault. You didn't cause this to happen. Um, we can't control human nature. What we can do 
is we can lock the door on it and we can catch it before it gets too far. The only difference between a $10,000 embezzlement and a $100,000 embezzlement is when you catch it. We need some music. <laughs> Oh yeah, make sure you have systems in place so that no matter how hard an employee knocks on that and tries to get through your systems, that they're not gonna get around you and they're not gonna steal from you. Well, right. but now's the time when if you have those questions, we'd love to take them. I've seen some coming in as we as we go and uh, Amber and Wendy are gonna feed them to, to me because uh, it's their chance to put me on the hot seat. Um, if you want to contact us, that's how to do it. And let's see what we got. All right. Who's up, Amber? Okay, I'll start real quick. Um, okay. Carl Slicer. Um, yeah. He, Hi, brought, Carl. He, he brought up something um, that I did forget to mention um, about uh, dishonesty insurance. And that is if you turn that claim of theft over to the insurance company and the insurance company uh, pays out on that claim, you give over the right to the insurance company to go and collect that money. What's that word I can't ever say, David? Subrogation. Yeah. Subrogation. Um, so, yes. You know, you have an $80,000 loss and you claim on your insurance and you get $25,000 back from them. Um, then you and the insurance company go after the thief. It, it kind of depends on the policy terms and which state you're in as to whether the insurance company recovers first or you do. In most in most jurisdictions, you get your money back first. And once you're made whole, then the insurance company can claim after that. Um, but it's called subrogation. And really that means you're, you're kind of assigning some of your claim to the insurance company. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Thanks, Carl. And I have another one that's really important too. Um, Gary had asked for a little more explanation about reconciliation and, and why it's not okay to reconcile um, like the merchant statement with the bank statement. You want to give that a shot and see if you can explain it a little bit better? Yeah, absolutely I can. So when you have a merchant account, what, the, what, what happens is very simple. When a, when a client, when a patient pays you by credit card, a couple of days later, the money goes into your bank account. Um, that's automatic, it's computerized and it's more or less foolproof. Um, reconciling the merchant account statement against the bank account statement is very unlikely to prove anything. What you really need to do is reconcile the banks, the, the merchant statement against your practice management software. Because if somebody is, for example, taking cash and putting it in their pocket and recording it as credit card payments, that's where it's going to show up. The credit card statement will always agree with the bank statement. That's, that's kind of a fool's errand. You really need, again, to, to look at, at credit card versus merchant account. And I'll give one more tip on credit card statements as well, Wendy. Um, I know a lot of doctors who look at the day end tape, you know, that's printed out from the terminal, the, the, the one on the little narrow paper, and that's what they reconcile. No, you need the monthly statement that the credit card company sends you. If you rely on those daily tapes, what you never know is whether there were transactions that took place on a Saturday when your practice was closed. The monthly statement is where you need to go, not the daily one. Yeah, that's a good explanation. Um, and I, I'm sorry, Amber, let me, let me, I have two that I've lumped together. Um, so two people asked two separate questions with just about the same, um, the same question. So one person was saying, um, if I suspect my office manager of stealing, should I, should I speak to my office manager about it and then follow up that with, um, if you suspect what is the first step, how do you not confront or do call or, or do you call first? Um, if you suspect the, your first action should be to call somebody who's an expert. Um, and I guess by that, I'm really talking about us. Um, we said in a previous webinar, do not confuse somebody who knows 20% more than you do with an expert. Um, when you talk to us, the first thing I'm going to say is no matter what you do, do not let the suspect know that they're a suspect. 
if I'm stealing from you and I think I'm about to get caught and I think the consequence of getting caught is that I'm going to go to jail, the list of things that I will not do to, to prevent all that is really short. Do not confront the staff member until you have a lot more information than you do now. Um, first of all, if you're wrong and there's some possibility that, that you're wrong about this, you're going to ruin the employment relationship permanently. I mean, there's just no way you and that office manager will be able to work together again. And if you're right, you don't want that person to see the ax that's about to land on them because they may do something to try to protect themselves and you're going to be the victim of whatever they do next. Amber, Wendy, anything you, you want to add to that? No, yeah, no. I, I like what you said. Okay. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Uh, someone wanted to know, uh, when looking at oversight, what are the three reports that you think are the most important to look at? If we're talking on a daily basis, uh, and let's, let's differentiate between daily and monthly. On a daily basis, I want to see the insurance, filed, the insurance claims filed report that Amber mentioned. And I want to see what is called in most practice management software, a day end report or a day sheet or something like that. And that just lists every transaction that happened in the practice for that day. So if, I'm, if, if we're talking at end of day, to me, those are the big two. On a month end basis, now what I want to look at is the month end report that's kind of just the bigger version of the day end report. So the, the transactions for the whole month. And if I, I guess if I had to pick two others, um, I'm, I'm going to pick one that's, that wasn't even on our list. Um, and this, this, is a, this is a quickie. It's an easy one to look at, and it's pretty high yield. Ask your alarm company to send you what's called the access log or entry log. So this is a report of who armed and disarmed your alarm and when they did it. And it's your way of checking to see if somebody is kind of sneaking into your practice after hours. So I'll put that one on the monthly list as, as one that takes very little time and has, has the potential to, to yield uh, information. Beyond that, um, wow, could be uh, the, to me, okay, I'll, I'll pick, I'll go out on a limb and I'll pick the third one, insurance aging report. Uh, I wanna know, you know, if, if there are claims outstanding and why. And as Amber said, you know, sometimes it's because claims aren't being closed properly. Okay, that's, that's benign. Sometimes they were never sent in the first place. And sometimes they were sent and the insurance company came back with requirements. You know, they wanted narrative or they wanted radiographs or they wanted something and that never got fulfilled. So a good barometer of, of your staff efficiency is really to look at that insurance aging report. So those are my three, but I think you could make good arguments for other ones as well. I'm glad you picked insurance aging because there's a question related to that. Um, the question is, is the insurance aging report and the insurance accounts receivable report the same? Um, they, they, they measure the same thing, but in different ways. Um, the, the, the claims report looks, the, the, the insurance uh, receivables report tracks dollars. So how much is owing from insurance, you know, and how much is over 30 and over 60 and over 90 and so on. The insurance claims report looks at individual claims and whether a claim has been quote closed or not. So you send a bill to insurance, you get a payment back and an EOV and you enter the payment and, and, and adjustment if it's, a, if it's a PPO. And then what happens in your software is that claim gets closed. So the aging report tracks open claims and you know, behind every open claim is some kind of action that's needed to get that claim closed. So one's dollars, one's claims, you know, in a sense, they're measuring the same thing, but I think your focus needs to be individual claims. Mm -hmm. And we've had a lot of questions and I have to apologize because it's, it's my fault. I did not make this clear. We we've had several questions on how um, people obtain the continuing education code. Oh yeah. Um, oh, that, that's very simple. Uh, there's a, there's a, um, an email going out to you all in about four minutes, and that will have a button in it that you can click. It will take you to a web page, and you'll certify that you attended, and uh, from there, you'll get your, your certificate by email in about five more minutes. It's, it's like instant. So um, really easy. Just uh, wait for the email that's coming out in a few minutes and, and, and uh, follow the instructions, and you will be um, in possession of a certificate. Okay. And another question just popped up and it, it's a 
I'm really not giving good. a book away for that one, by the way. <laughs> okay. It's a really good one. Okay. It says, are you saying that no one besides the owner is allowed to make adjustments? I had someone delete the cash payment after she had given a receipt to the patient. Then a few weeks later, she, I'm not going to, I'm not going to yeah. that sentence. Um, but it did not appear on the day sheet. It, you two can figure out and Rocky can figure out what happened, but I'm, I'm not going to say it. You know what happened? Yeah, I know what happens. So we're, we're back to selective reporting. Um, you know, the decision about how to handle adjustments is a really tough one. I, I would like to say to you, you know, if you're in a small practice, the, the best answer is uh, practice owner is the only person who can make adjustments. Um, the only thing about that is that you are going to set yourself up for a fair amount of pestering from staff who need to make adjustments because they want to close insurance claims and move on. So if, you know, it's, it's not wrong to do that, but, but understand the, the bother factor. So next best is you delegate adjustments to office manager. Um, and then when you do that, you need to do a couple of things. And the first one goes back to something Amber said a while ago, do not allow people to make this miscellaneous adjustment over and over again. And if anybody makes a miscellaneous adjustment, they need to put in a narrative as to why. When you think about adjustments your practice makes, they, they fit nicely into some categories. I mean, we have PPO adjustments and we should be even more specific. In other words, we have PPO adjustment Delta, we have PPO adjustment Humana, we have PPO adjustment Cigna and so on. Um, you have professional courtesy adjustments, you know, which might be if you're a specialist and you're treating the patients of, uh, you know, you're treating a, a dentist, a general dentist who's a referral source to you, there's an adjustment for that. You know, there's friends and family, there's an adjustment for staff dentistry. There's an adjustment for the poor guy who's crowned didn't fit three times, um, you know. And, and, and the number of adjustments that don't fit into any of those categories should be really, really small. So first thing is the, the rule has to be if, if somebody's making a miscellaneous adjustment, they need to type narrative as to what happened and why it doesn't fit in any other category. Um, when you have delegated the adjustments, what you need to do then is monitor. So you need to look at the adjustments and, and we gave you a whole list of things to look at in terms of timing. Um, I think this was Wendy's slide, um, you know, timing and magnitude and things like that. You need to look at those adjustments and see if they make sense. The best time to do that is the end of the day. If you're trying to look at a whole pile of adjustments at the end of the month and you don't really remember what happened with those patients, it, it, it's a lot more difficult. So that's one of those things that should happen in that 10 or, or, or 15 minutes that you spend at the end of each day. And I'd, li I'd like to make a point about this too, because you know, I always got to do it. It's my favorite thing. Okay, so basically what happened, what I'm assessing happened from the description is that um, a patient came in paid cash, was given a receipt, which means it was posted in the software, then they deleted the payment, and then they made some type of um, transaction in which was to cover, uh, to cover the scheme, okay? But the way you could have found that was looking at your deleted transactions report because the cash was posted in the software and it was deleted. So reviewing your cash payments in, Reviewing the deleted cash payments in your software would have would have caught that. Perfect example. Yeah, it sure is. Okay, so here's another one. For a large practice with four to five people in the front office, is it okay? Is it okay if all do the adjustments if the note is explained as to why? Um, I, I don't love that approach. I would I would rather see in that case, one person like the office manager be the person who makes adjustments. Or if there's one person who posts insurance payments, um, that person might have adjustment privileges. But no, for, for five people to have them, I think creates a monitoring challenge. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's fine to say they have to post an explanatory note, but so what? I mean, I can, you know, I, I can get pretty good at making up explanations that you think is, are, are plausible. Um, you know, and when, when you think about most of the adjustments that are, are made in a practice, they really don't need explanation. So if, if you're in network with Delta and you get paid and you adjust from UCR to contracted fee, I mean, I don't see a whole lot of point, first of all, in making somebody type a big long explanation for that. I would rather see the proper code, but I also want somebody with supervisory authority to be looking at it. Yeah. All right. Uh, can did, I we, add? Did, did we run our questions dry? We did. No, I, 
Oh, sorry. Amber. I have one more actually, sorry. Um, how would you go about telling another dentist not to hire an individual because you know that the person they're going to hire has been suspected of embezzlement, but was never prosecuted and charges were never brought onto that? Okay. Good question. Good, good question indeed. I'm going to make an assumption here. I'm going to make an assumption that you know that because that happened in your practice. In other words, this is a former employee of yours. And, and um, the question is, how do you let that other dentist know? What you might do is say to that, you know, call that other dentist and say, I see that um, Susie's working for you now. Um, I don't know if you know this, but she used to work for me. I don't recall you ever calling me and asking me for a job reference. You might want to. And you hang up the phone. I like that. And as soon as they can hit redial, your phone will ring and it's their new employer who will say, I'm calling for a job reference on Susie. And then what you say, and, and, and listen carefully here, make sure you get this right. What you say to whoever calls you is, well, since you asked, I'm only going to answer one question about Susie and that's, would you rehire her? So whoever's calling you, who's now getting kind of used to following your direction, even if it's a little cryptic, is going to say, all right, I'll play this game. Would you rehire Susie? And your answer will be not in a hundred million years. That's all you have to say. Don't say why, don't say suspected of embezzlement or anything like that, because that stuff in certain circumstances can get you sued. On the other hand, if you say, under no circumstance that I could remotely imagine would I rehire Susie, Nobody can sue you for that. That's talking about what you plan to do in the future. So that's how you do it. All right. Well, Perfect. we are actually over time. And, um, you know, I know if I, I, I know there are some people who are ice hockey fans in the audience and they're just itching to go and catch the rest of the game. So uh, maybe at this point, we'll, uh, we'll thank our audience for uh, hanging out with us tonight and we'll wish everybody a, a good night. We will see you in just under a month on July 22nd. Um, we've got a great session planned then and uh, enjoy your summer. Good night, everybody. Good night. Bye. This concludes this episode of the Prosperident webinar series. The team will be back soon with more tools and ideas. If you have questions about this webinar, if you would like to discuss your practice with one of us, or if there is a topic you would like to see in a future webinar, we would love to hear from you. You can contact Prosperident through its website, www.prosperident.com, or by calling 888-398-2327.